everybody for our Wednesday evening Design Uncensored. Hello, thanks for joining us. So we're gonna wait a couple seconds. The notification just went out and so um, I see all of you joining us tonight for our this week's episode of Design Uncensored where I am going to be speaking with a dear friend of mine, I think I say that every week, I'm very blessed with my friends, um, creative talent, really creative genius, and visionary for where there are gaps um, in the marketplace for design. So um, let's see, my, somebody said, where is here? Well, here for me is New York, um, and here for the show is Design Uncensored. So I, every week, Wednesday at five, I go live, I interview a new talent, and we discuss all things color, design, and trend. So hello, hello to my friend Mitchell in Florida, and um, Michael and Mary, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. So again, tonight I have the pleasure and the honor of bringing to you Donald Strum, who is one of the principals of Michael Graves Architecture and Design. And the Michael Graves Studio, oh, the legacy, the namesake, is alive and well. The mission continues on. And their firm was just known for really incredible design um, on the architecture side, iconic buildings, iconic relationships and collaborations, and also on the product side, which is where Donald has really spent the bulk of his career bringing out product that was dubbed really the entry point to the democratization of design back in the 90s. So I'm so excited to um, be interviewing Donald. And let's see, because I saw him join earlier. So Donald, I know you're watching. I need you to push the little button that says, um, invite me in to the conversation just like we practiced earlier today. So for those of you who went live with me and Donald earlier today, um, you saw me without hair and makeup, but I got old Donald's up. I got gussied up for you all tonight. Okay, let's uh, see if I can get this going. We shall try with technology. I am adding. Hi, hey Stacy. Hello, hello, welcome Donald. All right, well cheers. Oh yeah, cheers. Cheers. Cheers to everybody out there also in Instagram land. Um, I matched my wine to my hair tonight. A little rosé. Wow, it does. I like your glass. Yes, thank you. I went fancy for you. I figured, you know, it's, it's a show about design, so, you know, we would we would talk all things design. So, I, I made the intro. I did a little bit of background. Donald, what an incredible opportunity that you had to really bring the vision forward under the Michael Graves aesthetic and be the person who was leading the charge for their product design um, and their industrial design division for the firm. So, you know, back us up. I mean, you've been there, I don't want to age you, but- Well, I'm going to say, I, I like to say my entire adult drinking life. Okay, so, yeah. okay, so that's a good way to put it. All right. Yeah, so since I've been there since uh, I was 21, and I am 58 now, so that's yeah, that's uh, quite a few decades of uh, of really focusing on the diversity of product design. Yeah, and it's interesting because you've covered so many products in the career over there. Um, I know I was reading over 2,000 products. I think it's probably well over that now. Ah, uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, it's been uh, moving along and advancing. Yeah, so you know, maybe twenty two hundred, you know. <laughs> and what you know, do you I know it's hard because people ask me this too, um, I'm a product designer as well, but do you right. have a favorite? Is there a favorite product? And I'm not talking about the new stuff, let's talk about things that have launched into market already of the two thousand plus. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, I mean that's always that's always a hard question to ask because I mean very much like uh, Michael Graves used to say, like they're they're sort of all your babies. They're all your children. You know, you're 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 giving creation to them, and then they're birthing out to the world, and hopefully they're doing good things uh, for for society and uh, in that way. Um, but if I was to 
talk about experiences that were the biggest experiences for me. There's really, there's, there's two quick ones. There's one, um, maybe they're not so quick, but w there was one where we got the opportunity to work with Stu Ben Glass. Um, that was in Elmira, New York. It was part of the Corning, uh, Corning group at that time. And that was all about craft. That was all about these incredible glass blowers who had apprentices and were on the job for years upon years. And it was this level of artisan where they would, it was, it was pure alchemy, where they would just take hot molten glass and make it into the most divine objects. And you'd be there in the field, right, up, you know, right, right coming out of the glory holes, what they called it, on the punji stick. The glass is turning and they're, you know, they're putting a little, a little pocket of air in there. Right. And then it just starts to form. And the, the master gaffer would ask you, you know, uh, how, how's, the, how's the angle here? How's the curve here? And you're in real time designing, you know, with glass. Yeah. And so that was that was sort of that artisan aspect, and then it, it was just you know beautiful objects that came out for Stu Ben, and then there was Target, you know. Then it was the, this artisan aspect, and the, then industrialization, you know, yeah. of of the largest assortment of humble products that that needed reinvention, needed to be looked at in a new way, and Target gave us that that ability to do that. To do that, so that was just like going to the factory and seeing like the pounding of injection molding machines, time after time, just happening and just churning the most beautiful objects out that we were able to imagine. Yeah. And so those those are like but two amazing experiences. Because, you know, that's such like a, you know, it sounds like a dirty process, right? Like you're talking about the industrialization of just manufacturing, just that raw material, pounding well, out, pounding I, I mean, out. You took yeah. something that you dubbed humble just now, you know, that you took these humble objects, but you really created art objects out of them. And I think, you know, the Michael Graves Architecture and Design Studio really was from the design studio arm of Michael Graves that led the charge along with a couple others. You know, you had Philippe Stark back uh, doing some things as well. And, but really brought design to the masses. So just take us back there. I mean, for, for those watching, give us a thumbs up if you remember going to Target and seeing these, you know, these ordinary objects now be uplifted to a place of design. I mean, if you remember that back in the day, um, because I know I do, and when we had the opportunity to meet, I was just, like you said, talk about experience. I remember being so excited to come to the Michael Graves office and studio and, and be walked through because I remember all of that product. So take yeah, us through. It, it, it's all, it's it's almost like you visit. It's, all, yeah, it's almost like you're visiting old friends, right? You have some association with them. Um, they were at that point. I mean, it's a. It was a very different time when we started this project in 1998. Uh, that and and again, the only type of there was just really sort of high design going on. And there was a couple. There were there were types of products that we were doing for Alessi, which is like the little tea kettle up here you see that we did. And, but those, but those were, those were really weren't accessible to everybody. I mean, it had a price point of about two hundred twenty-five dollars for a tea kettle. You know, and you're you're boiling water. You know, and that's what you're doing. And it, but it's the experience of that that boiling water. I'm not discounting it. But how could you bring that idea to to everybody? You know, so everybody can enjoy design. Design should be accessible at that point. We're thinking for everybody, and that was always. That was always the casting dream of ours. Is just like let's make it available and let's get the price points that we really wanted to be able to do. So there's, you know, there shouldn't be a price difference between good design and bad design, right? Sometimes bad design take might cost more, but it shouldn't if it's just being considered in the right way with the right materials, with the right people, with the right factories. You can do wonderful things, and that's what we learned. You know, so uh, so we were able to take factories that might have been doing other uncommon or Everyday uh, objects that really were foreign to you, or felt uh, in, uh, they felt they just didn't feel the connection. Um, they might have been just a, a race to the bottom in price point. And mm -hmm. when we wanted to give them a life, we wanted to give them personality. So with Target, we had the opportunity to design in um, many categories in the store. We started off with 150 products, and we wanted to do the most mundane of products. You know, products that were had been overlooked. Um, things like tea kettles. You know, in that in that way for that for that audience, um, things like cleaning products. You know, mm -hmm. cleaning products. There there wasn't Swiffer back then. There wasn't these amazing cleaning products. It was just like the most. It was a straw broom. Yeah. Know, so what can you do to bring life and and um, personality and a soul to a broom? You know, at that point. And, and what we did, we actually we actually accomplished that with a toilet bowl brush. 
Now, a toilet bowl brush is, it can be a nasty object, but we designed it in such a way that people didn't want to toss it out or throw it out. They wanted to figure out how could this live on. I mean, it was, it was, a, pla it was a plastic object, and it, it sort of was very sprightly. It had a translucency to it, and then it had this incredible handle sticking out, this blue handle, and it just basically said, grab here and clean away. You know, it right. promoted cleaning in such a way, like, you couldn't wait to use a toilet bowl brush. And that's, I don't know about that, that, but I do remember <laughs> the toilet bowl brush. Was that, what yeah. was the object? Wasn't something on the cover of Time Magazine? It was a toilet bowl brush. It I mean, was. I did, yeah, you made, we made the centerfold of Time Magazine with a <laughs> toilet bowl brush. Now, that's good stuff. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah, yeah, and, we, and at that point, we were probably selling, I'm just going to put out six to 7,000 of those a week, you know, at seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine, if I can remember. You know, just for what that was doing, and that was just incredible. They just the, the, like this is before you could go online and switch by. Yeah, and it just it wasn't happening at that level in 1998. You know, yeah. you just you had to go to a museum shop to get those types of objects. I mean, I think um, I think Philippe Stark had done a version of a toilet bowl brush, and I think it was for Heller Design, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was fifty or sixty bucks. Yeah. You know, and here you are able to come in. And get one for seven ninety nine that was doing everything it needed to do, and more. It had it just was telling a story about you know the, the it wasn't just a product it was an object you know it was to be looked at in a do, new way. It basically said reach down and hold me, grab me, use me. You know? yeah. So that's that's what we were looking to connect connect with that way in that way. And tell me because you talk about giving a product soul, like what does your process look like when you're beginning? that, you know, conceptual phase. You know, you sit down with Target, like you said, and you had 150 uh, items on your list. How do you begin? What's that process look like? Yeah, you're, you're looking to create a brand language. And as you know, as a product designer, you know, what, what is going to be associated with you? What is the look and feel? What are the forms? What are the colors that are going to distinguish what you're designing through the smallest gestures that people can identify it with you, right? It's this, it's this rationalization of getting it to the, the, the to just the essence of what it needs to be, and all those in all those factors. And, and in this case, we decided to celebrate the egg when we were in Target. In the Target case, we sort of we did some studies on and knew that the egg was a very embraced form by people. They thought it was like one of the purest forms out there. Now, it might not necessarily be strong, but it is, you know, it's, it's again, it's about creation, birth. So we decided to take that egg form, and we instituted it in a way that we ran with it through many of our houseware products. So it became part of the handle. And we also realized in, in, in working with that form that it actually felt good in the hand, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice that it lent itself to looking good in the, in the, good in the hand. And then it, it became... A finial. It became part of a the top of a pepper grinder that you could hold on to. It became a really true touch point, and it lent itself in the most magnificent way. And then we would just be liberal with what the colors needed to be. Whether and still we wanted cool to the touch, which would be blue. So a lot of blue was really showing up in that line. And then we also wanted to, you know, and then when we used red, it maybe denoted the metaphor of heat or warmth. Right. And yellow was just, yellow was just sunshine and sprightly. You know, it was just to just to bring a smile to your face. And I think that's really what was happening with a lot of those products, where before they, they were just treated as, you know, sort of institutional or generic, and here we wanted them to be this experience where it made you smile, you right. know? So, it, so in, in that case, we incorporated this formulaic aspect of ha adding some whiz whimsy to it. So there was, there was whimsy, there was delighters, and there were what, what many of the, the buyers at Target would call, give us that wow, that Graves wow factor. You know, right. So we, we, we had the opportunity to design in 22 categories of the store. And that was just because we became a really great marketing idea. But not only that, we had to compete. We had to compete with those big brands, the Oxos of the world, right. you know, the, and, you know and, and hold our own in those stores. Otherwise, it's a tough world out there in retailers. And, and back in 98, you know, they, they would know down to the minute how things were doing. And if you weren't able to hold your own, you're gone. You're right. And we held our own. Yeah, yeah. Right. We took full responsibility in the process. That's amazing. I, I mean, I love that, you know, concept, like you said, of even just adding a little bit of whimsy to something that otherwise is not only, a, you know, a commodity type of product, but something that otherwise 
it's like the product you drink. It's like going to the dentist. No offense, Ira, you know, who's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's a fine it's a fine line and how you do it. You can't be it can't be too literal and it can't be too abstract. You have to find the area between where the two meet, the literal yeah. and the abstract meet, in order to come up with something new. So you know, so the literal sort of brings you in and you understand it, and the abstract gives you that 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 sort of strikes the senses. You know, it gives it that power, that what, and that, and that's part of it. You know, knowing how much to give and in the balance of of the literal versus the abstract, and that's what was happening in that line. Like, just if I was talking about that little jaunty um, finial, that little egg on top of the, on the kettle, we didn't have it going straight up. We just sort of turned it on an angle, and that created this dynamic. It, it just sort of set it into it just set it into an activation mode, and I think that's part of it. You know, how you activate your products are really important. You know, as, you, as you know, as you go through these things, how to activate them so they really speak to people. Well, like you said, it's that's the difference between the product having soul and the product being stagnant. Yeah, right. versus me too. Versus me too product. Just I'm going to show up. I'm only going to give you a little bit of this. I'm going to check off the list just a little bit. Versus you know how how can I really bring it to a point that people want to they they, they really want to use it in a way that. Is extreme almost. You know, it's just like it, it, it becomes this what we, we dub this word countertop ability, where the products engage on your countertop in your in your kitchen and they're standing out, but they're respectful to the other product next to them. And again, that's this whole personification of with these products. And that's basically also how we would design. They were there was a real anthropomorphism to the to the products, meaning they related to the body, to the human being. You know, yeah. there was a there was a head, there was a body, there was a foot. And that was part of the formula that you had these little creatures doing the work for you in the kitchen. Right. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I love that. So for those of you who are just joining us, um, I have the pleasure tonight of speaking with Donald Strum, who is a principal at Michael Graves Architecture and Design Studio. He has spent his whole adult drinking life, is how he described it, at that company. Oh, yeah. And he was the um, visionary and lead designer in a lot of what, the, really all the Michael Graves products, that we have come to know beyond the architecture piece. So we're talking right now about the Target collection that really put them on the map, that made the everyday person know who the Michael Graves brand was, um, and really was the one who cracked the code. I mean, we were talking about their time cover with the toilet bowl brush that was part of that initial collection. Yeah, the, the centerfold. The, center, the <laughs> centerfold, rather, um, of the democratization of design. And you're talking about, you know, personifying the piece, you know, in terms of your process, wanting to add whimsy, wanting to add personification, looking at it as more than an object, looking at it as almost a little being. And it reminds me, and we've talked a little bit about it, but I, I'm curious to hear, you know, it reminds me a little of Disney, of, you know, that, that sort of Walt Disney magic. And I know your team has had some work that you've done along the way with the Walt Disney group, because there is a similar um, humor in the design. Yeah, we we had um, the great opportunity to do quite a extensive work for the Disney Corporation back in the late eight, the late '80s and into the '90s. Um, and what I mean by that is, it, it, down in Walt Disney World, there are two major hotels: the Swan and the Dolphin Hotel. And though that work was done by our firm um, with with the Disney Imagineers, um, and so that you know, so it started off in reimagining. You know, not doing sort of char character characters, a character theme, and I, I think what was what we wanted to do is we wanted to celebrate, you know, in Disney World we wanted to celebrate the Renaissance. So we did our take on Renaissance figures down at Disney World in the Swan and the Dolphin Hotel. If I was to sum that up, and then from that came doing all the furniture. Uh, we had the opportunity to do the Disney headquarters in Burbank, California, where whereby we took the seven dwarfs. And we used them and employed them as caryatids on the facade of the of of the main facade of the building. So what that means is the the the, the, the dwarfs are actually holding all seven of the dwarfs are holding up the building in some way. Where at some other point it might have been some some female figurine, you know, some right. from from another from another era from Grecian times. But now right. it's now the now the dwarfs are really doing the work. You know, they're whistling <laughs> while they're working and they're holding up the building the best they can. You know, so we had great we had great opportunity and to do our, our it became sort of dubbed as entertainment architecture. It was a thing. It was categories its own thing. But then from that came the products. 
you know, so we got to take a look at how would Dis how would Mickey be on a tea kettle, and we, you know, it wasn't a literal taking of Mickey; it was an abstract taking of Mickey. Uh, it was a stainless steel tea kettle, you know, and I think it sold for $100, $110. Uh, for years, they sold it all over Disney World and, and all, the, all the Disney shops at that time. And it was just a great hit. And then from that came Pepper Mills and entire houseware collections. And it, that was just really fun to do, you know, to sort of, we had carte blanche with Disney, the um, character integrity. And not too many people get that as artists. Like character integrity said, you know what? Um, Take a whack at it. Uh, you know, show it to us, but we're not going to hold you to these behemoth sort of Disney bibles of what the characters have to look like and behave like. And we were able to sort of abstract them in that way and let them be seen in a new light. Yeah. I think there's a similar ethos between the companies, which is where you earn those, you know, that ability. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I, I think they were just, again, that was all about delighters and seeing things employed or used in a way that, un that they would be viewed as unexpected, right? That's what we're looking to do. That's what we're saying when we talk about striking the senses. You want to be, you want to see things that are, they're familiar to you, but they're not so familiar, and they strike your senses, and you're like, that's really cool. I, I didn't expect that. You know, that, I, I didn't see that coming. And I yeah. think that's, you know, that, that's, what I, that's what I look for in, in our work, and that's what I look for in the, in the work of others. I mean, I could just say, like, the, I, I was telling you, you know, I, I, I really like, I really love your manic style, you know, that you came out with tile bar. And, and, and I, I was, I've been taking really close looks at that, and I think it's, what I love about it is the fact that you just can't pin it down. There's so many aspects of it that you become a part of the formula of how you want to use it, right? You're, you, the, you, you, the specifier, you, the, the customer, get to figure out, and I don't think there's a wrong answer, right? It's, it's no, only a right answer how you're wrong. going to, yeah, and, and again, it's, it's a quarter circle, and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And the color palette are these muted pastels, and then there's some really nice neutrals in there, and it just it makes you part of the process. And I think that's also important in experiences and doing product design and what we do is people become part, it, it, you, you you allow them to coordinate it, to use it in their home in a way, to sort of have fun with it, yeah. right? And I think that's what happens in many of the tile patterns that I'm seeing you're doing. I mean, do you, do you, do you feel that when, in that collection in particular? Because I feel that's a really iconic piece for you. It, you know, it is because there's so many ways to iterate on it. So it's, it is very different where the last collection was sort of a, a more of a pre-baked mosaic and a field tile it was a little more standard, a little more we conceived it and here's the three colors it comes in. This grouping, like you said, I think just leaves so much room for pattern play. And so what we did was sort of kicked it off with, here's a starting point, here's some ideas, you know, that different ways of laying it out, different ways that you could take it. But like you said, it really becomes like a box of crayons that, you know, yeah. you get to decide what, what palettes to choose, how to lay it out, how to iterate on it. And it's fun for us to be able to see the ways that people are using it because it's different every time. And it's much of it is very different than, we would have come up with in the beginning. So it's really isn't that isn't that always the best, the sort of unexpected moment where you thought you considered everything, and then like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know it could be done that I way. Know, and how it, yeah. and I long enough, also my, my whole adult drinking life as well. <laughs> <laughs> that I think you know from from our end, especially working so hand in hand with interior designers and um, you know creative types, is I'm always just inspired. It's more than pleasantly surprised. I, I'm continually inspired by the creativity of yeah. the people who use our product and what they do with it. And I think that's, you know, part of what keeps us wanting to do more. Yeah. So talk to me about the impetus of that design. I mean, I know I've seen it in the throws and I love your throws, but I'm, I'm yeah. always really interested of wh where and when the it strikes you, where the formulation of that idea comes from. Where did you do the sketch? And, and again, this is a quarter of a circle, right? Yeah. It, it couldn't be simpler, but then, it, it, but it's so relatable, right? And, that, and, that, and that's a lot about design. Design has to be, there's a reductive process to design to get to the essence of things. Well, the essence of things. Okay, so to answer that question very quickly, because I, I have so much more I want to ask you. <laughs> I know, but I'm interested yeah. in you. So to answer that question on this particular one, this was a design reduction. It was a much more complex pattern that had been developed um, with different layers of the circles in a you know more interesting multicolored layout. And it was a reductive process in saying what's that 
core element and then how do you use it in the function of a tile and then once you break it down to a sort of minimalistic piece you know the singular unit of it the sky becomes the limit and so that that's really how this came and and the time felt right for it and as you know when you're working on product development it's more than just the concept you really have to think through the finish the reflectiveness of it what the color palette's going to be how it's going to be used sort of what's the taste in the market where is it leaning and so there was a lot of reasons why you know we, we chose not only the muted pastels because we felt color is going to be good to have a moment but softer um, but also the matte finish was an important finish that we felt just felt more new, more unique, a little bit easier and somehow more casual, but yet elevated. So it was, it's especially when it's done monochromatic makes it, it's a simplistic, but very classy, highly graphic piece. Yeah. And I think what's important too in design, and I've, a couple of key things for me is just is the fact that how, how it forms, how products are memorable to people. Yeah. Like I could, I could show that to, and, and my litmus test is always children. You know, if I was to show that, that's that pattern to children, they would be able to draw it from memory after seeing it for one second, right? And that I think that's that's the essence when I talk about essence of really getting to simplicity. This it's getting to the essence of design and really having um, a successful idea. You know, and I, and I I, th I think when it becomes too confusing or too complex. Um, People can't remember it. I mean, I I I, mean, I could probably say to you, or if I, if I showed you know your children, if I showed them our tea kettle, and just even let them look at it for a few minutes, or not even a few seconds, they'd be able to draw it from memory. And I yeah. think that's important. If I was to say, if anyone, if a design student is watching today, I think that's really important in design is the memorization of how it imprints itself on the person who wants to be part of it, wants to own it, wants to uh, wants to purchase it. You know, yeah. is, is the fact that they. It, it's easy. It's it's digestible in that way. I think that's, and I, I think all the best design in the world has that. If it gets too complex, I think it's. I think it just it gets confusing, and you can't you can't describe it. I mean, that's why you know that's why I'm in such awe of people who design cars that they're able to do that. Right. You know, and, and just being able to that's that's its own design form in itself. But I you know but. It, it's really important to get to those few strokes in order to articulate and express what you want to say in design. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And that's a good suggestion. If anybody's watching who knows, you know, car designers, maybe that'd be a good interview too. <laughs> but, you know, back to your passion pro you know, project, I'm gonna call it, but really what we were talking about is your life's work. Um, and, it, you know, I was looking at your website, you know, at the Michael Graves um, Architecture Design website, and your bio comes up, and it talks a little bit about all well, the work you've done, the 2,000-plus products that have already hit the market in all of these forms. Like you said, everything from tea kettles to pepper um, grinders to toilet brushes. But I know there's something that's on your heart that you're really passionate about, and that started, you mentioned, really when Michael became ill. So talk to us about that um, and, and sort of where your new focus is. Yeah, and it, it really was in designing for wellness and healthcare. Um, I would say disability and elderly. And again, this I've had I've had an amazing opportunity to design just about everything except cars. Uh, <laughs> and 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 in doing so, I, I, I've. I first was sort of a little reluctant to the idea because I, you know, we were in the, this is 2003, actually 2004, Michael Graves became paralyzed uh, in 2003 and, you know, really we got to witness firsthand all the indignities of what it takes to get well um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a state where you can't walk anymore. You know, that was what we were witness to and, you know, he would talk to us and say, you know, if there's any time you can put aside can we think about you know what it takes to make a hospital room better, or what it takes to uh, get well at a rehab center? Because he had experienced uh, both of those eight times, six times, many different in and out, and they were done in a way that just didn't promote dignity or wellness. It was sort of counter to that, mm -hmm. and you were sort of stuck um, looking to adapt to what they imposed upon you versus. How I really want to get well, and what and what the space is saying to me about wellness. So we 
talked about that, and it was really like, well, what can we do? Where can we start? And you know, in architecture, you would see there'd be these grand lobby spaces of, of hospitals, and we thought, you know, I don't think that's where the healing is taking place. You know, we were having this conversation. You know, the, the healing and the wellness takes place in, in the room. Right. So it, in the hospital room, it's not in the lobby spaces. That's not where the patient is doing their healing and they're getting right. better. So we decided, well, what can we, how can we take on the, the patient room? So we talked to quite a few people and we, we determined that it had, to, it had to emanate from the bed. Um, and the bed meaning where you're healing, where you're spending the bulk of your time. And there's really only two bed people at that time, bed makers. It was Stryker and Hillrun. Mm -hmm. And for the best reasons possible, well, we worked with Stryker Medical. Um, we couldn't do a bed right out of the gate because the lead times and the amount of work that goes into making a hospital bed, it's, it's just, it blows your mind. So we did patient room furniture. We did the, the, we did the recovery chair. We did the overbed table. We did the, the bedside stand. And then from that, we thought, you know, how do we connect the dots here? Is there something else that we could consider? And we thought about the, the wheelchair. The wheelchair is like the gatekeeper of the hospital. It's the first thing you see when you enter. And that sort of presents itself in a way like what kind of, what kind of, what kind of service am I going to get here? Because you know what they look like. I've said it in wheelchair. It's something you already flashed into your mind, right? Right. It's that black wheelchair, Everson Jennings, 1933, the X-frame wheelchair, and that doesn't promote healing. That just promotes illness, sickness. And, and, and I know that because I did the litmus test with my son. You know, I put him in a wheelchair when he was very little, and he pretended he was sick. I didn't right. say anything to him. You know, it's like out of the mouth of babes. And then when we designed a transport chair, uh, meaning our version of a wheelchair, it was he turned to me and goes, Dad, push it fast. So it was all right. about that activation. So he went from being sick in the wheelchair to be push me fast, Dad. I want to go fast. So that you know, so we were onto something there, you know. And then from that, we wanted to keep pushing. We realized, like, well, what about what's going on in the home? What about you know, like you're you you design this incredible. And I and I talked to you about like I want to use Maddox Maddox tile. I want to use that in, for my master bathroom. I just being home now with, with COVID, we've already we've done two bathroom renovations. Now we're going to do the master bathroom, and I want Maddox. But if if I have an elder, if my, mo if my mother is living with me, I'm going to have to run out and buy what is available for a raised toilet seat or a commode. And that, that's not going to work with my idea of that space. It's an afterthought. It's not a sort of from the very beginning, the impetus of creation of how that can integrate with my bathroom as being right. part of the process. It's always an afterthought. So, you know, we just thought like bath safety is a big, big overlooked category. Yes. You have grab bars, but even right. the grab bars are big and chunky. Like we, we designed a grab bar, and they that come is, metal and metal. That's it. Yeah, they, yeah, they come in metal and metal, and they just they're they're just they're they're unsightly and they're big and giant grips. And how can you do it in a different way that maybe creates the idea of a lattice? You know, just saying the word lattice is pretty damn pretty. You know, so right. so, can, so so we wanted to look at these in another way that these products really. They're overlooked. No one's addressing certain mobility devices. And what I mean by that is like, you know, canes. You know, what, what a cane is. What, what, All right, you hold know, that uh, up again because that doesn't look like a cane to me. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, and what's happening with walkers? I mean, nobody wants to be, nobody, it, 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 nobody wants to be seen in a walk, walker. And you can see I get really pumped up about this, uh, Stacey, yeah, I really well, do. Because, I mean, I was living it with one of my grandmothers. She refused. She couldn't see, and she wouldn't be caught dead with her walker. Exactly. She I wouldn't mean, it was be, like how about like bumping you, into things. She yeah. did not care you know, to her. It was, you know, a negative. It wasn't something, like you said, that was cool looking and, you know, would lift up her experience. Yeah, and makes her feel like she's getting well and she's remaining active in the world, and then only yeah. she can show off. Now again, right. these products have to have every every functional aspect to them, and then some. They're all right for improvement, you know. So we're doing all that, but we're also making them look beautiful, and we're making them like I, I've been talking to some people that we, we designed recently. We just, we're in the works of work designing the most amazing folding cane. So it's not just it's just not a full cane, but a folding cane. And someone, it's a person we were talking to. He was a, a CEO of a company. He said, you know. If I gave a regular cane to my mother, she would slap me across the face and say, what's wrong right. with you? But right. if I gave that, she would say, you love me. You see, you right. care so much about me. You know, because it's ultimate. How do you make 
these products that nobody wants giftable. And that's a great challenge, right? Wouldn't you like yeah, to be able to take that sure. on? I, I so, think we're going to, I mean, I'm excited about it. So any kind of a teaser on, you know, when we can expect to see some of these in the marketplace? Yeah, we, we are in deep talks um, with an amazing retailer right now who sees the opportunity in making a difference in people's lives. And we are hope to look for this launch in the in the in the fall of 2021. You know, these, they, it, so it takes as you get it takes a while. Ladies and gentlemen, to... you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think these are the important things. Like you said, these products that really haven't been looked at, they've been overlooked. It's not overlooked. They, they've been overlooked. Yeah. That if you gave them more than just a pretty paint coating, but you really are rethinking the whole idea of the whimsy of it, the whole idea of the functionality, the whole idea of that it's not just to lean on as you age or as you know you, you have you know ability or mobility taken away. It's really there to uplift your mobility. It's there to yeah, keep it's, active and it's a it's, whole reframe on how these products are brought to market. Yeah, it's part of your lifestyle. The way like if I wear these glasses, you know, they, they really help me see, but hopefully I look pretty yeah. decent in them. So this is eyewear you know, why not, you know, these the, the sort of, you know, durable medical wear, you know, just like, or just these products have, a, they become part of your, an accessory. You're wearing a watch, you're wearing earrings. Why yeah. can't they become an accessory? It's a, part a, of your aesthetic at that point as well. You know, what it says to you is, I'm in the no on design. You know, I, right. I made this purchasing decision the same way. Like you said, you can get an inexpensive pair of glasses, you can get a designer frame. Your choice says something about you. And I think that's it. Do the same thing. So we, yeah. we're out of time, but I'm going to do our lightning round. So we'll wrap oh, okay. Up wow, that went fast. All night. I'm <laughs> a huge fan, totally obsessed with the work that you've done, and you know, just I'm honored to have you on here. So, all right, quick lightning round. This is what we're oh, doing. All right. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. All right. So, number one is we've all been on lockdown. The first place you plan on traveling when you can unlock your doors and get out. Oh, um, we're we're going to Denver, Colorado next month to oh, go fun. go to the Rocky Rocky Mountain National uh, State Park. We're we're going to the mountains. Fabulous! Have so much fun. The kids coming too. Oh yeah, we're all going. We're all getting right, a big suburban and going into the mountains. Yeah, we're renting a big suburban. I love it. All right, good. All right, next question is: What is is there a book that has changed your life? Is there a book that has changed my life? Oh my God! I'm, I, uh, um, if you, you know, young design student, what should I read? Um, I, I, I can't remember exactly the name on, but it was a book on proportion and um, the golden section and golden rectangle. That changed my life in design. And I, I have been, I just can't remember the name, but it's about it's about divinity in in form and space and the golden rectangle and uh, using using All that right, form. So you'll, you'll Google it. You're looking yeah, at golden, the golden you'll section. On Instagram? Yes, I will. And yes, put I'll my name that. on it so it shows up in my feed too. Mm-hmm. All right. So, in, or you have one of your young marketing gurus. Wait. What about you? What's a book for you? What's, what, what book changed you know, your life? <laughs> I have a bunch of them. I mean, it's funny. I'm rereading Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Totally oh, cover it. Stephen Covey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. I'm reading a book right now called American Caesar on Douglas MacArthur. You know, that's the book I'm reading. But it's not changing my life. So here, somebody <laughs> is saying, is it called Desi Divine Proportion? Um, I, I, you know what? Gold? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to look it up. I have okay. it right yeah, downstairs. And I'll, some, uh, yeah. Wisdom of the crowd over yeah, there. Yeah, because I, yeah, we always try to instill this this sort of divine proportion, this golden rectangle, in everything we do right from the beginning. You know, it's it's all it's all in here. It's some proportion of it, in some fragment of it. Yeah, and then my last question to you, and this might be more than a lightning round, but it's the idea that you said, you know, when you started working with Michael years ago. You believed in that mission of it being bigger than you. What, do you remember that kind of turning point moment where you were like, yeah, I'm hooked uh, at this company. I'm hooked on this vision. Uh, I think it happened for me when I went to visit um, one of his buildings in Louisville, Kentucky. It was within, it, 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 was, this, it was the second summer I was there. Because the first summer we were sort of working on the models for it, and uh, or other, other models, and then to actually be experience his space and go to the opening of the building and realize like aha now I know what he's talking about now I understand the importance of 
of the proportion of the building, how to bring the inside out, how to add streetscape and interest so the public comes into the building as well. Um, really looking at the contextualism of the space, of the area, which had the Ohio River. This is Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and then at every facade, on the four facades, every facade was different because it was reacting to the area that it was looking upon. And I thought that's really interesting, that you're just not imposing uh, architecture. You're basically looking at what's out there contextually and letting it influence your architecture. I love that. I love that. Well, keep the brand going. Keep the dream alive. I think it has certainly transcended him. It has transcended you. And we are excited to see what's yeah. next for from your passion projects yeah. and all of these things that are going to really hopefully be a major improvement on our health and well-being um, as, you know, as these things unfold. So we look forward to seeing well, it. Yeah, on that, we're all going to age. We might as well age well. I mean, definitely. As my grandmother said, the one who's still hanging in, she said, Stacy, you're going to bury me looking good. So, you <laughs> as well have some cool uh, products. Such a pleasure. That. Such a pleasure, Stacy. Yes, thank you so much again, Donald Strum. I appreciate you and your time and your friendship and all of your creativity. Keep yeah. doing good in the world. One other thing, I want to talk to you about a bathrobe. At one point, I, I I watched I seen you on QVC with the bathrobe, and I think we could bring something more to it. I agree. Let's let's yeah. talk about that. Any collaboration, yeah. Amy or Sassy is clapping for that. So yes, the fan as well. And yeah. um, again, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We appreciate having you watch us live. We wish you blessings um, in the week ahead and inspiration.